Welcome, Elizabeth. This is episode number 21, and we have Elizabeth Dean with us. She's an artist now based in London. She does all these beautiful traditional arts and Indian miniature, a lot of geometry, and she's going to tell us and share all about her process, um, all the works that she's done, her amazing solo show, like lots of chats that I have saved in lots of questions. Um, you are also welcome to send in your questions um, if you want me to ask Elizabeth. So let's start with this. Elizabeth, could you tell us a little bit about you, just a little introduction and how you started as an artist? Um, well, as you've already um, mentioned, I'm, I'm primarily a painter. Um, and I'm very much inspired by Islamic geometry and uh, miniature painting from India and Iran. Um, and I, I came into it quite a long, kind of quite unusual journey to becoming a painter or becoming a, a professional painter. Um, I always studied art and everything through school and um, I've, I've always drawn and painted. Um, but it was really um, in, re in more recent years that um, through, well, initially I studied history of art at university and then I did an MA in uh, part of the world, arts of Africa, Oceania and the Americas. So I have a kind of quite a strong academic background in art. And then I worked in galleries, museums, uh, trained as an art teacher but we felt a bit frustrated that I wasn't doing more of my own creative practice. And at the same sort of time, decided to go to India. And this was just during one of my holidays from school uh, when I was working as a teacher. Um, and through a number of trips, the first one was to um, Shantiniketan in West Bengal. And I went there to uh, teach English and to train primary school teachers. Um, but Shantiniketan is quite an amazing place. It's um, got an incredible art school there. And it's um, Rabindranath Tagore's sort of vision. His, um, there's a, he's a poet and a writer and a, a polymath really in many different ways. Um, and through um, his, he kind of had this vision of a universal world and education inspired by the environment and so I first visited the art school there and then a, a while later did a second trip to India, um, which I, I kind of basically it was a holiday. I went to meet my brother in Udaipur and um, I met the painter Sanjay Soni, who was a miniature painter. And he kind of, it was through doing a three hour lesson with him that I was like, wow, this is what I want to do. Um, but how can I sort of pursue it? Um, and that's how I ended up going to the Prince's School of Traditional Arts. I love that. And I didn't know that you were an arts teacher before. So yeah. like when you say you trained as an art teacher, did you do like the teaching qualification and then you went into arts? Yeah, so started off thinking I would follow art in a very academic way and do a PhD and then sort of why lots of different reasons ended up training yeah, as a secondary school art teacher. So I did my PGC at Cambridge and then through this kind of journey uh, and ended up where I am now. Um, and actually I've got a photo, if you'd like to see a photo of sure. um, Sanjay, uh, let me just see. Is he the same teacher that goes into the Prince's School and teaches um, the miniature classes there? Uh, no, it's not actually. Um, that's mm. Ajay and Vanita Sharma. Yes. Um, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> and this is actually, this is photo. years later. This, this image is years later. This is when I went back in 2018 and I told him I've had this like quite amazing few years and I'm now working professionally as an artist. And uh, this was going back years later. And now he sends me miniature brushes and things. 
Oh, that's amazing because miniature pr- brushes are actually really hard to get. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to describe the picture for um, the listeners. And it's one of the teachers that first started you into miniature. And I will add it into the Instagram account for the podcast so people can see the photo as well. So tell us about that three hour lesson that you took your first lesson. How did it like what in that lesson made you think, this is what I want to do? Uh, That's a really good question. It was it was the absolute basics of miniature painting, um, which if you're familiar with it is, you know, it's quite quite a different process, I think, from normal other different styles of painting. Mm. And um, you sort of apply areas of block color and then work the details over the top. Um, And I think I was attracted to the block colour, what I love about Indian miniatures is you have these emphatic, vibrant colours, um, which are so beautiful and so inherently beautiful from the natural pigments. Um, and then it was just the, the slowing down to do the detail with a squirrel hair brush. And it's just, it's almost quite meditative. And we live in such a crazy world where we're all Uh, you know looking at our phones and buzzing on social media and looking at the internet all the time and it really helped me to kind of slow down and think about things more clearly and I enjoy I really enjoyed that. Oh that sounds so good and you touched on Indian miniature and how it's different and it has a different approach. Um, Can you tell us slightly more in depth about the kind of techniques other than the color blocking? You also use natural pigments, you use a special kind of brush that is not really used in different types of art. So if you tell us a little bit of an overview just for people who are not familiar with miniature. Yeah, so I've got a couple more images um, here. So these are just uh, traditional examples of miniature painting. Um, But let me just uh, show you this image, which is of a slab with a muller and um, grinding the pigment to make into paint. And it's quite an intense and laborious process, really, making paint, especially if you do it from starting from the very beginning, looking at the minerals in rock form and then crushing them with a metal, pestle and mortar, and then moving to the slab and the muller and then making it into paint by adding um, your gum Arabic. Um, So uh, it's a process that I use for almost all of my colors. Um, And I I enjoy it because you're connected to the process of making, but also um, creatively, I find a bit like when you do the detail at the end of a miniature painting, the actual making your paint, I also find gets you into the right frame of mind for creating because it's a similar sort of, um, it's quite a repetitive process and it allows you to think about the colors you're gonna use and um, even what you're going to paint. And when you talk about the natural pigments, what are your favorite natural ones that you use and that you crushed and where did you get them from? Uh, Well, I I get pigments from all sorts of places. Um, Some of them I've sourced from India. Um, Some of them I've got from Cornelison's, AP, Fitzpatrick, Crema. Like you can buy um, pigments online, although you should be a little bit careful of the source. Um, yeah, so, sorry, what was the rest of your question? And let me remember, it's like, it's harder when it's live because it was like, hmm, what did I just <laughs> ask? Um, so what are your favorite natural colors that you work with? So you mentioned that you're getting them in rock, in rock formats or you're getting them in powders and from different sources, but what, what are the actual rock names? Like, do you use lapis and? Uh, yeah, so if my favorite colors definitely are lapis, that incredible vibrant blue color. I love obviously malachite, which is this beautiful green. Um, And for those watching, you can see see that in some of these colors in the image. Um, Sometimes I source, some things are difficult to get um, in the UK. So there are some colors that I've sourced specifically from India, 
and they're quite kind of unusual ones. I really love the, um, it, it's lapis, but it's basically from the impurities and it may, it's like a, it's a very gray color, but it's a slightly bluish gray. And I think um, some of the min miniature painters, they call it um, capra, which basically means the rubbish stuff um, because it's the, like, the impurities. But I really love this beautiful gray color. Um, and it's what I used for painting such as the golden yolk, the one with the turtle in. Um, and you, you can't be, in a way, the natural pigments do have a, an alive quality to them. Um, and they're not just minerals, some of them are from plants, like the very dark, almost black, blackish blue for, for indigo or carmine, that beautiful crazy red, which is um, from cochineal crushed, crushed beetles basically, um, which I love because you can water it down and you can get a really lovely, um, quite light pink color with it, or you can get this very intense, almost red color with it. Um, I want to tell everybody about the first piece that I've ever seen of your work, and that was during the degree show. So I walked into the degree show for the Prince's School, and it was filled with beautiful artwork. And then I came to your station, and you had this painting, which is obviously Indian miniature, but it was different than the traditional examples. So you had a very small, hence miniature, like super <laughs> miniature lady, um, an Indian lady in her traditional dress but she was flying a kite and that's a different scene than the usual traditional ones that you see depicted and this is kind of a theme within your work where you are using various um, scenes that are very modern and like very contemporary and mixing that Indian technique. Yes, that is the <laughs> painting I'm talking about. And I absolutely loved it. Like I really wanted to buy it, but you know, um, next time you do one, I will. <laughs> so what promoted you to kind of mix those scenes with the traditional techniques? Um, so this kind of, I had a, a variety of in, inspirations. I mean, there's some amazing, um, kite flyer paintings, or there's one specifically that I'm thinking of, which is in the V&A, but there are actually lots of Indian miniatures. And um, I liked the idea of having a woman flying a kite, because I think it's kind of a, a symbol of sort of liberation and freedom. And there's something quite playful about that. Um, but I also wanted to mix. So I've, I do these like very intense and detailed geometry paintings and um, but I also really love doing flowing kind of figures and um, I love painting faces and so I wanted to mix those two what have almost become like different styles within my own painting uh, mix the miniature miniature with the more um, geometric work that I've been doing and then this particular piece um, which I've done in a, a few Di different kind of colors. So the one you would have seen in my degree show, um, I think there was a red one, which was more uh, vibrant cinnabars and uh, carmine. Um, and this one has actually got a malachite background, but I wanted to have, um, it kind of have the idea that from far away, it has, um, it was like a bold block of color, almost quite abstract. Um, and then when you get in close to it, you can really appreciate all the finer details. Um, and actually these background colors that you can see in this image, um, that although they look simple, they're actually really difficult to do, especially um, on large, like larger scale, um, because minerals like cinnabar and malachite and lapis, you know, they have heavy particles. So you have to kind of keep your paint mixed up um, in order, so it doesn't start to separate before you apply it. And so it took a long time for me to learn how to do this um, specific kind of background using those mineral pigments. And it was actually working in Ajay and Vinita's studio in Jaipur that um, I worked with one of their assistants called Luigi. And he, he showed me how, and it's not easy how you apply these, um, these areas of flat color on a larger scale. Um, and I might 
No, I don't. I thought maybe I'd have a brush that could show you which brush you use. <laughs> yeah, because like I tried to do the exact same thing when doing a lapis background and it's actually so much more complicated than you think. Like when I thought about it, I was like, oh, that would be a great background. And in practice is really difficult to move the color. And once it dries, it was really difficult to mix. So it's like, I think I started with it being smooth at the top part and then it became a bit rigid and weird at the bottom I'm like oh well I'll just leave it yeah and also like um as an artist you become like very particular about different mm. ways that you want certain things to like look like and uh for these I mean sometimes you can get quite an even effect if you're applying it quite thickly but I wanted it to have the sort of um, the paper coming through a bit so it doesn't get too too heavy. Yeah, you get that lightness of the color because as you said, it's like it's easy to go into the heavy parts, but that lightness is actually quite difficult. And it makes the light move, which is what you want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so you mentioned the colors that you prepare, but preparing color is not the only preparation that you need to do before you even start. So there are like series of preparations that you kind of undertake before you start your painting. Can you tell us a little bit about them, please? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it varies a little bit according to whether it's um, looking at the miniature paintings or whether I'm preparing for a geometric painting. Um, the miniature ones tend to come from, uh, either from seeing something that you love and you really want to paint, and then I tend to research it. So for example, um, the parakeets, the parakeet paintings I did for my solo show, um, I saw them in Hyde Park, and there's an area of Hyde Park where they all come and feed off your hands. and so I, I loved them, the electric green and the pink ring around their neck. And, and then I did further research into them and found a great manuscript called the Tutanama um, and worked, you know, sort of from my own experience, but also from stories that I'd looked into. And it was also the same with um, the golden yoke painting, the turtle painting. Um, uh, like my grandmother has a tortoise at home and I've been interested in uh, painting terrapins or tortoises for quite a long time and then came across this really um, beautiful Buddhist story. Um, so that's how that painting came about. Um, what was the story? It's, um, it's a basically a story, it's a Buddhist teaching and the story goes that there's a turtle at the bottom of the ocean and he only comes up every 100 years to take a breath. And on the surface of the ocean, there's floating around and you can imagine the ocean is this vast scape and there's this golden yoke floating on the surface of the ocean. And it's kind of, what are the chances of the turtle putting his head on that time he comes up through the golden yoke? And it's kind of about this idea of, um, I think in the Buddhist sense, it's an idea of the human life being this very precious and rare thing. And we have this ability to um, choose to follow spiritual teachings and to make, um, to make intentional choices. And um, it's to remind us of that and how rare it is, um, our, our human life. And I've actually, I can um, put that have painting. a picture of that. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, up on the screen. And we'll <laughs> describe it for the listeners as well. So as you said, it's like kind of the ocean, but ocean depicted in Indian miniature style, where you have all the details. You have like the little waves and the movements captured in white. And then you have that line connecting the ocean with the sky and obviously the turtle, the golden yolk. And it's like, it's all like the little details that you picked out with color as well. So I just like, I like to describe the arts because yeah. sometimes you want to give people that visual image so they don't go and like look it up right away. They can like wait until the end of the podcast to go find <laughs> out. And um, so this is how you take like 
the idea of some of your miniature pieces. So when it comes to preparing for the miniature and the geometric pieces, you said the preparation is different. So in technical sense, what would you do that's different to say the paper or your brushes or the colors that's different for each of them? Um, I suppose normally with the miniature paintings, um, you do often size the paper and um, after you've applied areas of color, you would burnish it. Um, and I've actually, I've got a burnisher here. <laughs> um, oh, perfect. So you, this is a really small one, but often they come in different sizes and they're agate stones. Um, and you burnish your area of color, um, rubbing it, pressing um, quite hard to, so it has a sense of heat. Um, on a glass surface um, and that enables you to paint in by, by basically the purpose of doing that is to make it really really smooth that area of colour the idea being that you can then paint this incredibly fine detail over the top um, and with the miniature geometries I don't tend to worry so much about burnishing Perfect. And it's like, it's really good to know the different process for each of the pieces because with miniature, what you require is different than what you would require for the geometry. But saying that even your geometric pieces are very small and detailed. So it's like your shapes within that big piece are really tiny. And one of the pieces that you have done for the solo exhibition is like, I don't want to call it the flying carpet. Yeah, <laughs> but it, I'm sure it had a specific name, but it felt like when I looked at it in person, it was like this big geometric carpet of shapes and everything was so tiny. We're talking like one centimeter for like a circle or like I'm sure I feel like some of them yeah, were sure. even smaller. <laughs> so like tell us about the creative okay. process of that piece and how we do we have yeah that yeah they, um so th this was a bit of a crazy undertaking if i'm completely honest <laughs> um it took me between nine or t ten months even most of the duration that i was preparing for my solo show and um i guess what i love about geometries are the infiniteness of them um, there's like an infinite number of things that you can do with them. And I, I really wanted to experiment with like, because um, this is using a pattern which is from the Bu Inania Madrasa in um, Fez in Morocco. And um, Adam Williamson um, told me that's where it's from. And, and basically, I like the idea of experimenting like with tessellations within tessellations. So although it is using that pattern, it's not using it in the sort of strict traditional sense. Um, and this painting I worked on so, sort of consistently, but intermittently while I was preparing for my solo show. So it, it gave a kind of backbone to the preparation of all of the other paintings. Um, but it was one of those pieces where you're you constantly, like optimistically, I, I think it made me realize I must be quite an optimistic person because I'd constantly think, oh, it's almost finished. And then hours and hours later, you'd realize, no, it's not at all finished. <laughs> yeah, I know that, this that exact feeling. <laughs> and you're like, it's like when I do a piece or when I edit the podcast, I'm like, yeah, yeah I'm almost done. Four hours later, I'm not even done. But it, it kind of it gives you that sense. It's like, I'm going to finish soon, but it's like the colors are almost complete in one area, but then you have all these other areas that you're like, okay, I need to get into them. Yeah, and I, I, it was also a piece where I feel like it was inspired by a different things. Obviously it's inspired by all of the Islamic geometry and the beautiful Zelij work, um, but also a little bit looking at um, Native American rugs and the kind of more simplistic um, diamond and triangle shapes that you find in some Native American rugs. and looking also at the work of Annie Albers, who um, she's, um, she was jo Joseph Albers' wife, and he does these um, colour paintings, really. Um, but she did these beautiful weavings, um, sort of inspired 
by these rugs and and that those inspired me i saw her show at the tate modern just before um i started the preparation for my show no oh, that's amazing and since we've been talking about the solo show could you tell us a little bit about it so that was your first solo show and it happened in london the end of last year it was really cool was it the beginning of this year or the end of last year no it was the end of last year yeah yeah um, and we, so my friends and I did a little exhibition tour and we went to your solo exhibition, your husband's solo exhibition and like to other people as well. And it was full of inspiration. I had to sit down after the end of that day and I was like, I need to take in all this art. So first, congratulations. Yeah, and tell us a little bit about how it all started because a solo show is a really big deal for an artist so how you know how were you approached and how did you start the process what did you decide to add into your solo show like everything um it it's hard i mean so grosvenor gallery where i had um, my first solo show and where i'm currently exhibiting a few small paintings in a group show at, virtually at the moment uh, called aspects of geometry um but basically, I, I, I'd always loved the gallery. So I'd been there a few times to see um, other shows before um, while I was at the Prince's School. And it had always been a gallery that I'd really wanted to exhibit in. Um, I loved the painter, Olivia Fraser, and she was one of the shows that I'd seen there. So it, it was kind of on my radar anyway. Um, and then um, after my time, um, at the Prince's School, I kept working um, and I got a studio and decided really to take it seriously. Um, and I guess um, it, it's hard to know exactly how, how it happened. Yeah. Um, but I think through posting things on Instagram is a really good way of um, connecting to other artists and galleries. Um, but it was through um, being a finalist in the Asian Art in London Award. Um, that was how, uh, along with Irfan Hassan and funnily enough, my husband, um, Jethro Buck. And it was through going to the award ceremony at the Serpentine Galleries um, that I think I was first on Grosvenor Gallery's radar. Um, and then it was a few months later that they approached me. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and how was your organization for the show? So you did a lot of, like, I think every piece was like a completely new piece for the show. So how did you organize what you wanted to paint and the theme of the show? Um, so, some things kind of came about quite organically. So the name of the show, Rhythmic Measures, is from a Rabindranath Tagore poem. And that seemed quite fitting because it has a line in it which reminds me of this idea of tradition coming through the ages. Um, but, but also it was a connection to India and my love of India and Indian miniature painting. Um, it's really like, there's no easy way of saying it. It is really hard preparing for a solo show. Um, it completely, I, I've never worked so hard in my life and I, I really, did dedicate everything to it for a year um, and, and, and lots of paintings come about in quite a kind of organic way by working you come up with ideas and you just have to make your everyday working a consistent event um, and working hard and then I think things they do start the things that you didn't know that you know if that makes sense that you've learned from different teachers and stuff they um technically they come back to you while you're preparing um and ideas you just have to look, look for things that inspire you and interest you yeah and it's like it's funny you say about that things come to you while you're doing things and that i find that so true and i feel like sometimes we are like sponges and we kind of save things in our subconscious and then it takes a few years and things surface back so like when I first like learned about natural pigments I was like oh this is cool but what a waste of time 
that was like my first reaction to natural pigments and now like six years later I'm like oh my god this is the most amazing thing I have to do it <laughs> and it's just like I'm constantly trying to develop recipes and like understand it further like I have a whole episode about natural pigments for people who are interested in that and it's just things surface back especially with art it's like a continuum it's like a circle and it's just they come and it it's so interesting and sometimes it's kind of unexpected as well I get a lot of my ideas before bed and I'm like oh I don't know what to do with myself do I fall asleep do I get up and like write an idea so I completely understand where you're coming from how about you like when do you usually get ideas not just when you're working like do you get them um yeah I, sometimes they come to you in kind of daydreams and yeah. you that, that that's uh often I think you should go with the flow when you get an idea like that um sometimes they're from actual dreams um and sometimes they're through the creative process so through um drawing things which interest you through looking at lots of different visual material um and through stories and folklore um, one of your pieces did come to you through a dream and I'm I remember reading it on your Instagram and I was like that's so interesting that you took a dream and made it into a reality so could you tell us a little bit about that piece uh yeah it was called the, the albatross snow dream I think um it's one of the I suppose it was a very special piece for me because it was one of the pieces where I really um felt the confidence that I could um, paint using the Indian miniature techniques, one of the first pieces that I felt that. Um, but it was also, yeah, it was from a very vivid dream that I had about standing on top of a, a white building, uh, a quite modernist building with a glass roof that I could see everything quite clearly through. And um, there was this magnificent, albatross one of these beautiful they're, they're absolutely incredible creatures and sadly they're endangered um in the wild but um i i just remember it flying over above me um and while it was snowing and i remember the sort of feeling of feeling like the crisp snowflakes like hitting your face and your shoulders and it, i i guess i love the idea with that one because most of my pieces are so um colorful and it's all about the colors um, but that that painting was quite different because I wanted to capture the fact that it was a white building and it was white snow and then albatrosses are predominantly have white feathers. So it was a very muted painting in comparison to lots of the others. It's so interesting. One of um, my artist friends did a whole show on dreams and it would, all the pieces came to her basically in her dreams every single piece that she drew and I was like oh my gosh yes some vivid dreams <laughs> like um I have vivid dreams sometimes but not that much like they were very detailed <laughs> which is like so interesting so we mentioned your husband Jethro Buck and he's also an a miniature artist so tell us how how is it like living with an artist <laughs> being two artists preparing for two solo shows at the same time um absolutely i mean honestly absolutely crazy uh we kind of imposed it was almost we were living in cambridge uh for that that year and we were almost in a sort of self in, in a new city with not that many friends um because we've just arrived and it was a bit of a self-imposed isolation a bit like what we're all going through now um and it was very intense but through that intensity comes a lot of creativity and and also because it is so intense it definitely made all the difference um being with someone who is also an artist because they can understand this the late nights working um and you have someone to ask questions like you know what do you think of this and do you think this works better with this and you know that you'll get an honest response but from a sort of um personal life point of view it, it was mad I mean our kitchen table at one point had so many paintings on it that we couldn't sit down and eat dinner at it any <laughs> any longer uh, towards you know the actual art couriers coming to collect everything um 
so so yeah it has its ups and downs but overall it was a very creative uh creative time definitely oh i like the sound of that <laughs> and it's just like because my partner is an artist but our art is so different so he does all his like big scale paintings and things and i'm doing like these super tiny teeny teeny <laughs> things and it's just like sometimes having an artist with you is so useful like i sometimes call him my color consultant because um he gives me his opinion on like what colors we're going to use and things yeah, definitely. like that and it, it def it's definitely inspiring um just because although um our work is different there is definite overlaps in it mm. um and jethro was a few years ahead of me he went to the prince's school a few years before i did and um i've learned a lot from him as well so it's been like it's, it's been great for me um yeah and you guys did uh, a creative honeymoon as well when you went to India. I don't know if it was completely creative, but it's just like from the photos you posted and things, it felt like you both were on a journey of learning more art in India because you stayed there for a while. Yeah, we had a, we had an incredible time. Um, we, we went for two months at the beginning of 2018 and kind of combined it with um, sort of things we were interested in and wanted to go and see um but also some some time working with Adjay and Vanita in the studio and sometimes um seeing uh well we we were very very lucky we had the opportunity to go to Maranga Fort in Jodhpur um where in the painting archives they have some of the beautiful miniatures which are exhibited in the Garden and Cosmos exhibition and we got to see them up close and I'll just see if I can um show a couple yeah um but the, these are these are incre incredible um miniatures um sorry um so here here is an image of and you can see that you can get a magnifying glass and really get close to them so it was it was absolutely incredible to see these miniatures and especially because although they are incredibly traditional, they do, uh, and they're using the traditional miniature techniques and everything, they, these ones do have a really quite contemporary feel about them. And you can see um, with some of the areas of just complete gold leaf and um, limited intense detail. Um, and then obviously some incredibly detailed areas. But so we had an amazing um, time doing things like that. And then also, um, we had a, a wonderful day where um, we, Ajay and Vanita took us to a Hindu temple and we had a, a wedding blessing in the Hindu temple with them. So that felt very special. And as part of that, um, we built a, a sort of house from different rocks within the temple, which lots of people do as a kind of uh, symbolic of your future. That is so sweet. I really like the sound of that. So what's coming up next for you in terms of arts? What are you working on at the moment? Any projects in sight? Well, most recently, since the immediate lockdown, I've had a little bit of a break because it's been quite intense up until this point. Um, but I'm starting to the last week or, or so think about um, like a new body of paintings and we'll be working towards another solo show um, or various art fairs coming up um, with with Grosvenor Gallery. Oh that's amazing. And, and hopefully maybe a solo show which is in conjunction with a, a gallery in either India or Pakistan mm. um, which would which would be exciting and different. Of yeah. course. And um, what advice do you have do you have for new artists who are starting um, their portfolios, doing their work, and they want to get into be taking it more seriously and exhibiting either solo or in group exhibitions? Uh, that's a difficult question. I think the main thing is to work incredibly hard um, to use Instagram as a tool and to post your work and to post your process on it 
I, it's, a, it's a tricky one, Instagram, because I think it's a really useful tool for artists. There are lots of galleries using it. Um, but having said that, you have to be careful not to get sucked into it and be careful that you don't tie up your self-esteem with it in any way or let it affect the, the type of creative choices that you make. So I think in a limited way, like I think when you're preparing the beginnings of a show, it's important to do that um, quite quietly uh, on your own rather than uh, posting too much. Um, what else? I, I think for me, the Prince's School was a huge, um, I feel very indebted to all the teachers there. And I learned a huge amount in terms of actual technical knowledge, which is what I, I wanted. So definitely seeking or searching the right kind of uh, creative knowledge, like for you. Um, and going to art galleries and um, drawing, drawing your drawing through your ideas. I love that. And <laughs> it's like, as you mentioned about your relationship with the gallery that you're showing in, you, they were on your radar before you were on theirs, which I think is a very good life lesson in general. Like if you want anything, you have to kind of show up into that space and be like, okay, this is what I like. I'm gonna, you know, consume also, their think, information. Um, so something uh, in terms of galleries, I think people aren't often like different galleries have different sort of areas of expertise that they look at. And it's um, in very important to find a gallery that um, you share similar kind of either looking at the certain types of work or similar sort of ethics in a way, if that makes sense. No, it totally does. Because like, for example, I'm never going to show abstract art for like, that's just me. So there is, I don't feel like there is a, a huge point of me pursuing, say, a gallery that only deals with abstract art. It, no, exactly. it kind of besides the point of what I do. Yeah. <laughs> so absolutely. It totally makes sense. So thank you so much for all of the things that you shared. And how can people find you online? Um, so on Instagram, I'm at Eliza Dean. Uh, although Do you want to spell that? <laughs> yeah, although my name's Elizabeth, it's spelt with an S. Uh, so it's at E L I S A um, D E A N E. Um, and then also um, I have a website. So you can Google Elizabeth Dean and you should be able to find my website. But and also then have... the normal channels, Twitter, and <laughs> LinkedIn, all these things. <laughs> um, you also have a virtual show at the moment. So, and you have that link on your Instagram. So if people want to see more about that, they can check it out. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, we're wrapping up. Uh, let's see.